Hello, and welcome to this session on John Locke. Life and Work John Locke was an English philosopher and physician, regarded as one of the most influential of Enlightenment thinkers and also known as the father of classical liberalism. Considered one of the first of the British empiricists, following the tradition of Sir Francis Bacon, he is equally important to social contract theory. His work greatly affected the development of epistemology and political philosophy. His writings influenced Voltaire and Rousseau, many Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, as well as American revolutionaries. Locke's theory of mind is often cited as the origin of modern conceptions of identity and the self, figuring prominently in the work of later philosophers such as Hume, Rousseau and Kant. Locke was the first to define the self through a continuity of consciousness. He postulated that, at birth, the mind was a blank slate, or tabula rasa. Contrary to the Cartesian philosophy, based on a pre-existing concept, he maintained that we are born without innate ideas, and that knowledge is instead determined only by experience derived from sense perception. In 1647, Locke was sent to the prestigious Westminster School in London under the sponsorship of Alexander Popham, the Member of Parliament and his father's former commander. After completing his studies there, he was admitted to Christ Church, Oxford. The Dean of the College at the time was John Owen, the Vice-Chancellor of the University. Although a capable student, Locke was irritated by the undergraduate curriculum of the time. He found the works of modern philosophers such as René Descartes more interesting than the classical material taught at the university. Through his friend Richard Lower, whom he knew from the Westminster School, Lake was introduced to medicine and the experimental philosophy being pursued at other universities and in the Royal Society, of which he eventually became a member. Locke was awarded a bachelor's degree in 1656 and a master's degree in 1658. He obtained a Bachelor of Medicine in 1674, having studied medicine extensively during his time at Oxford and worked with such noted scientists and thinkers such as Robert Boyle, Thomas Willis, Robert Hooke and Richard Lower. In 1666, he met Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper, first Earl of Shaftesbury, who had come to Oxford seeking treatment of a liver infection. Cooper was impressed with Locke and persuaded him to become part of his retinue. Locke had been looking for a career and in 1667 moved into Shaftesbury's home at Exeter House in London to serve as Lord Ashley's personal physician. In London, Locke resumed his medical studies under the tutelage of Thomas Sydenham. Sydenham had a major effect on Locke's natural philosophical thinking, an effect that would become evident in his work An Essay Concerning Human Understanding. During 1670s, Locke served as Secretary of the Board of Trade and Plantations and Secretary to the Lord's Proprietor of Carolina, which helped shape his ideas on international trade and economics. Locke became involved in politics when Shaftesbury became Lord Chancellor in 1672. Following Shaftesbury's fall from favour in 1675, Locke spent some time travelling across France as tutor and medical attendant to Caleb Banks. He returned to England in 1679 when Shaftesbury's political fortunes took a brief positive turn. Around this time, most likely at Shaftesbury's prompting, Locke composed the bulk of the two treatises of government. While it was once thought that Locke wrote the treatises to defend the Glorious Revolution of 1688, recent scholarship has shown that the work was composed well before this date. The work is now viewed as a more general argument against absolute monarchy and for individual consent as a basis of political legitimacy. His ideas about natural rights 
and government are today considered quite revolutionary for that period in English history. Locke fled to the Netherlands in 1683 under strong suspicion of involvement in the Rye house plot, although there is little evidence to suggest that he was directly involved in the scheme. In the Netherlands, Locke had time to return to his writing, spending a great deal of time reworking the essay and composing the letter on toleration. Locke did not return home until after the Glorious Revolution. Locke accompanied William of Orange's wife back to England in 1688. The bulk of Locke's publishing took place upon his return from exile. Locke's close friend, Lady Masham, invited him to join her at the Masham's country house in Essex. He died on 28 October 1704 and is buried in the churchyard of the village of High Lava, east of Harlow in Essex, where he had lived in the household of Sir Francis Masham since 1691. Locke never married nor had children. Events that happened during Locke's lifetime include the English Restoration, the Great Plague of London and the Great Fire of London. He did not quite see the Act of Union of 1707, though the thrones of England and Scotland were held in personal union throughout his lifetime. Constitutional monarchy and parliamentary democracy were in their infancy during Locke's time. The major works of Locke include a letter concerning toleration, a second letter concerning toleration, a third letter for toleration, two treatises of government, an essay concerning human understanding, some considerations on the consequences of the lowering of interest and the raising of the value of money, some thoughts concerning education, the reasonableness of Christianity as delivered in the scriptures, a vindication of the reasonableness of Christianity. Influence In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, Locke's work, True Treatises, were not frequently cited. The historian Julian Harpet said of the book, except among some Whigs, even as a contribution to the intense debate of the 1690s, it made little impression and was generally ignored until 1703. John Kenyon, on his study of British political debate from 1689 to 1720, has remarked that Locke's theories were mentioned so rarely in the early stages of the Glorious Revolution up to 1692 and even less thereafter unless it was to heap abuse on them and that no one including most Whigs ready for the idea of a notional or abstract contract of the kind adumbrated by Locke. In contrast, Kenyon adds that Algen and Sidney's discourses concerning government were certainly much more influential than Locke's two treatises. In the 50 years after Queen Anne's death in 1714, the two treatises were reprinted only once. However, with the rise of American resistance to British taxation, the second treatise gained a new readership. It was frequently cited in the debates in both America and Britain. The first American printing occurred in 1773 in Boston. Locke exercised a profound influence on political philosophy, in particular on modern liberalism. Michael Zuckert has argued that Locke launched liberalism by tempering Hobbesian absolutism and clearly separating the realms of church and state. He had a strong influence on Voltaire, who called him Le Sage Locke. His arguments concerning liberty and the social contract later influenced the written works of Alexander Hamilton, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. Today, most contemporary libertarians claim Locke as an influence. But Locke's influence may have been even more profound in the realm of epistemology. Locke redefined subjectivity, or the self, and intellectual historians such as Charles Taylor and Gerald Siegel argue that Locke's work, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, written in 1690, marks the beginning of the modern Western conception of the self. Theory of Religious Tolerance and Political Theory Locke, writing his letters concerning toleration, 
in the aftermath of the European wars of religion formulated a classic reasoning for religious tolerance. Three arguments are central. One, earthly judges, the state in particular, and human beings generally cannot dependently evaluate the truth claims of competing religious standpoints. Two, even if they could, enforcing a single true religion would not have the desired effect because belief cannot be compelled by violence. And three, coercing religious uniformity would lead to more social disorder than allowing diversity. With regard to his position on religious tolerance, Locke was influenced by Baptist theologians like John Smith and Thomas Helwes, who had published tracts demanding freedom of conscience in the early 17th century. Baptist theologian Roger Williams founded the colony Rhode Island in 1636, where he combined a democratic constitution with unlimited religious freedom. His tract, The Bloody Tenet of Persecution for Cause of Conscience, written in 1644, which was widely read in the mother country, was a passionate plea for absolute religious freedom and the total separation of church and state. Freedom of conscience had had high priority on the theological, philosophical and political agenda since Martin Luther refused to recant his beliefs before the Diet of the Holy Roman Empire at Worms in 1521, unless he would be proved false by the Bible. Locke was part of this Protestant tradition. He was also influenced by the liberal ideas of pre politician and famous poet John Milton who was a staunch advocate of freedom in all its forms. As assistant to Oliver Cromwell, Milton took part in drafting a constitution of the independence that strongly stressed the equality of all humans as a consequence of democratic tendencies. Political theory. Locke's political theory was founded on social contract theory. Unlike Thomas Hobbes, Locke believed that human nature is characterized by reason and tolerance. Like Hobbes, Locke believed that human nature allowed people to be selfish. This is apparent with the introduction of currency. In a natural state, all people were equal and independent, and everyone had a natural right to defend his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Most scholars trace the phrase life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to Locke's theory of rights. Like Hobbes, Locke assumed that the sole right to defend in the state of nature was not enough. So people established a civil society to resolve conflicts in a civil way with the help from government in a state of society. However, Locke never refers to Hobbes by name and may instead have been responding to other writers of the day. Locke also advocated governmental separation of powers and he believed that revolution is not only a right but an obligation in some circumstances. Theory of value and property. Locke uses the word property in both broad and narrow senses. In a broad sense, it covers a wide range of human interests and aspirations. More narrowly, it refers to material goods. He argues that property is a natural right and it is derived from labor. In his work Second Treatise, Locke argues that the individual ownership of goods and property is justified by the labor exerted to produce those goods or utilize property to produce goods beneficial to human society. Locke stated his belief in his Second Treatise that nature on its own provides little of value to the society implying that the labor expended in the creation of goods gives them their value. This position can be seen as a labor theory of value. From this premise, Locke developed a labor theory of property, namely that ownership of property is created by the application of labor. In addition, he believed property precedes government and government cannot dispose of the estates of the subjects arbitrarily. Karl Marx, later critiqued Locke's theory of property in his own social theory. Limits to accumulation. According to Locke, unused property is waste and an offense against nature. 
But with the introduction of durable goods, men could exchange their excessive perishable goods for goods that would last longer and thus not offend the natural law. In his view, the introduction of money marks the culmination of this process, making possible the unlimited accumulation of property without causing wastage through spoilage. He also includes gold or silver as money because they may be hoarded up without injury to anyone, since they do not spoil or decay in the hands of the possessor. In his view, the introduction of money eliminates the limits of accumulation. Locke stresses that inequality has come about by tacit agreement on the use of money, not by the social contract establishing civil society or the law of the land regulating property. Locke is aware of a problem posed by unlimited accumulation but does not consider it his task. He just implies that government would function to moderate the conflict between the unlimited accumulation of property and a more nearly equal distribution of wealth. He does not identify which principles that government should apply to solve this problem. However, not all elements of this thought form a consistent whole. For example, labor theory of value of the two treatises of government stand side by side with the demand and supply theory developed in a letter he wrote titled Some Considerations on the Consequences of the Lowering of Interest and the Raising of the Value of Money. Moreover, Locke anchors property in labor, but in the end upholds the unlimited accumulation of wealth. On Price Theory Locke's general theory of value and price is a supply and demand theory which is titled Some Considerations on the Consequences of the Lowering of Interest and the Raising of the Value of Money. He refers to supply as quantity and demand as rent. The price of any commodity rises or falls by the proportion of the number of buyer and sellers. And that which regulates the price of goods is nothing else but their quantity in proportion to their rent. The quantity theory of money forms a special case of this general theory. His idea is based on money answers all things, Ecclesiastes, or rent of money is always sufficient or more than enough and varies very little. Locke concludes that, as far as money is concerned, the demand is exclusively regulated by its quantity regardless of whether the demand for money is unlimited or constant. He also investigates the determinants of demand and supply. For supply, he explains the value of goods as based on their scarcity and ability to be exchanged and consumed. He explains demand for goods as based on their ability to yield a flow of income. Locke develops an early theory of capitalization, such as land, which has value because by its constant production of saleable commodities, it brings in a certain yearly income. He considers the demand for money as almost the same as demand for goods or land. It depends on whether money is wanted as medium of exchange. As a medium of exchange, he states that money is capable by exchange to procure us the necessaries or conveniences of life. And for loanable funds, it comes to be of the same nature with land by yielding a certain yearly income or interest. Monetary Thoughts Locke distinguishes two functions of money as a counter to measure value and as a pledge to lay claim on goods. He believes that silver and gold as opposed to paper money are the appropriate currency for international transactions. Silver and gold, he says, are treated to have equal value by all of humanity and can thus be treated as a pledge by anyone while the value of paper money is only valid under the government which issues it. Locke argues that a country should seek a favorable balance of trade lest it fall behind other countries and suffer a loss in its trade. Since the world money stock grows constantly, a country must constantly seek to enlarge its own stock. Locke develops his theory of foreign exchanges, 
in addition to commodity movements. There are also movements in country stock of money and movements of capital determine exchange rates. He considers the latter less significant and less volatile than commodity movements. As for a country's money stock, if it is large relative to that of other countries, he says it will cause the country's exchange to rise above par as an export balance would do. He also prepares estimates of the cash requirements for different economic groups like landholders, laborers and brokers. In each group, he posits that the cash requirements are closely related to the length of the pay period. He argues that brokers or middlemen whose activities enlarge the monetary circuit and whose profit eat into the earnings of laborers and landholders have a negative influence on both personal and public economy to which they supposedly contribute. The self and education. Locke defines the self as that conscious thinking thing, whatever substance made up of whether spiritual or material, simple or compounded, it matters not, which is sensible or conscious of pleasure and pain, capable of happiness or misery, and so is concerned for itself as far as that consciousness extends. He does not, however, ignore substance writing that the body too goes to the making the man. In his essay, Locke explains the gradual unfolding of this conscious mind. Arguing against both the Augustinian view of man as originally sinful and the Cartesian position, which holds that man innately knows basic logical propositions, Locke posits an empty mind, a tabula rasa which is shaped by experience. Sensations and reflections being the two sources of all our ideas. Locke's work, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, is an outline on how to educate this mind. He expresses the belief that education makes the man, or more fundamentally, that the mind is an empty cabinet, with the statement, I think I may say that of all the men we meet with, nine parts of ten are what they are, good or evil, useful or not, by their education. Locke also wrote that, the little and almost insensible impressions on our tender infancies have very important and lasting consequences. He argued that the associations of ideas that one makes when young are more important than those made later because they are the foundation of the self. They are, put differently, what first mark the tabula rasa. In his essay, in which both these concepts are introduced, Locke warns against, for example, letting a foolish maid convince a child that goblins and sprites are associated with the night, for darkness shall ever afterwards bring with it those frightful ideas, and they shall be so joined that he can no more bear the one than the other. Associationism, as this theory would come to be called, exerted a powerful influence over 18th century thought, particularly educational theory, as nearly every educational writer warned parents not to allow their children to develop negative associations. Now you can try to answer the following questions. Write a short note on the influences and impact of empiricism in the modern world of thought with special reference to John Locke. Discuss the theoretical contributions of John Locke. Explain the epistemological features of empiricism of John Locke. What are the observations of John Locke on education? Write a short note on the concept tabula rasa. What are the central themes of John Locke's philosophy? Hope that you may go through the reference books for further reading. From Plato to Derrida by Walter Kaufman and E. Forrest Bide in 2008 by Pearson Prentice Hall. Ethics and the History of Philosophy by C. D. Broad in 2000, published by Rutledge in UK. The March of Unreason, Science, Democracy and the New Fundamentalism by Tim Delany, published by Oxford University Press, New York in 2005. A Land of Liberty, England from 1689 to 1727 by Hoppit Julian, 
published by Oxford Clarendon Press in 2000. Sources of the Self, The Making of Modern Identity by Charles Taylor in 1989 by Harvard University Press, Cambridge. An Approach to Political Philosophy, Lock in Context by James Tully in 2007, published by the Cambridge University Press, New York. Hope that you have enjoyed this session. We can meet again with yet another topic. Have a nice day.